another minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Visual Radio. It's August 25th, 2010, and we're here with Harlow Giles Unger, the last founding father, James Monroe, and a nation's call to greatness. It's great to have you here, Harlow. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. My co host today is Jay Harris, Jason Harris, Thank historian. And uh, you've got the paperback edition coming out October 1st, but the hardcover has been out since September of last year. Right. And we're hoping that the paperback will get out to more people uh, over a wider, ra wider range of the country. You've had a lot of books out. Do you find people enjoy the convenience of a paperback? Yeah, I think they enjoy the paperback. Uh, it is convenient, as you say. Uh, the hardcover is uh, more monumental. Uh, so I think they, they enjoy them both. I like having both, but, you know, on the shelf, the hardcover is kind of cool. And I, I just, I like books. I just, it stands out at you. Yeah. The Monroe book is especially interesting, I think, because uh, Americans uh, don't really know James Monroe, and which is why I wrote this book. And in his day, he was celebrated as uh, the second most important and certainly the most beloved president after Washington. Uh, he was the only president other than Washington to be elected without opposition uh, when he ran for his second term. Uh, the political parties disappeared. Everybody rallied under uh, the uh, single Star Spangled Banner and voted for James Monroe as their president. They loved him. Yeah. What a marvelous thing. Yeah, he was a great president, and uh, Americans today don't know enough about him. Uh, so uh, that's why I wrote this book. I would never have started thinking about him without your book. Oh, I'm glad you did. So, see, so you, you, you know, you, you've achieved the mission because people are, book comes out, people start thinking. Right. Why do you think his star has faded over the years? I think, uh, number one, you had the Civil War. And that uh, elevated a whole new phase of American history that took over a good part of the history books. And as the early years of the Republic faded in the history books, uh, he was left out, uh, simply forgotten, uh, probably because he did only great things. There were no uh, horrible crises. Uh, Jefferson, declare, uh, as president, uh, declared an embargo on trade that bankrupted the nation. Madison took us to war in the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. Adams uh, stripped Americans of their civil rights, their First Amendment rights to free speech and freedom of the press. So there were all these crises. And the, Monroe took over this country. Uh, it was besieged by enemies abroad, uh, ripped by dissensions and, and uh, internally. And he united the American people as never before or since, uh, not, not since Washington and probably not until Franklin Roosevelt in the Second World War, with the American people as united as they were under yeah. Monroe. Aptly named the era good feeling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he focused uh, first on, after the War of 1812, he focused on strengthening our defenses, the nation's defenses, to make us impregnable to foreign attack. Mm -hmm. And that freed the American people. They could go without fear, cross the Appalachians, into the wilderness, mm -hmm. and settle the wilderness. S six states emerged from that land rush, as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, more, uh, or as important as the formation of six states, the government, of course, was selling the wilderness lands to the, to the people. Mm -hmm. And this was the greatest exchange of land in the history of man, never before had a sovereign state sold as transferred a, a title to so much property to so many people not of noble rank. Mm -hmm. a, and with the uh, acquisition of land in our country, it meant uh, the right to vote, because you couldn't vote unless you owned land, it meant the right to hold office. You couldn't hold office unless you own land. Mm -hmm. So with the acquisition of land, tens of thousands of people not only acquired property, they acquired the right to govern themselves. They acquired political power. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the right to govern their community, to vote, to govern their communities, their states, and their nation. If you own land, you own the nation. Mm -hmm. And with the transfer of all this land under James Monroe, mm -hmm. uh, he gave the, 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 the nation to the people. Yep. Uh, if we can back it up a little bit, um, James Monroe spent uh, basically three tumultuous years over, and he had basically a front row ticket to um, you know one of the watershed moments in European history, the French Revolution. How do you think that shaped his um, his uh, political philosophies and um, you know his thoughts and the way he uh, went about his business, um, seeing the, the the tumultuous times over there and 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 the basically the anarchy that 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 was France for a while. Well, it it it. Uh certainly made him more conservative. He had been, uh, he was never quite as radical as Jefferson, but it made him more conservative. He saw the uh, anarchy there and realized that uh, without a, uh, a strong constitution, and he had voted against the constitution in the ratification convention of Virginia. Now, uh, he saw that without a strong central government, there's no way you can govern uh, a, a nation. Uh, so it made him more conservative. Secondly, he had a stake in uh, uh, indirectly fighting uh, the revolutionaries because when they arrived in Paris, he was sent as minister to, as American ambassador to, to France. And when they arrived, uh, uh, Lafayette was in prison and Lafayette's wife was in prison in Paris, sentenced to die on the guillotine. Yes. And he couldn't do anything uh, without jeopardizing his diplomatic status. So his wife, the beautiful and courageous Elizabeth Courtright, probably the most beautiful first lady in American history and the most courageous, got in the carriage by herself and rode through the Paris mobs to the prison gates and demanded to see Adrien de Lafayette. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the prison guard was uh, absolutely taken by surprise. Uh, uh, who's calling? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that the wife of the American ambassador. Hmm. And her, I mean, uh, the French people adored her. She showed the courage of a Joan of Arc. Yep. And, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, obtained, uh, I mean, it was an adventure out of the movies that uh, is detailed in my book. It's really one of the most exciting parts of the book. Uh, she got uh, Adrien out of prison, and with her husband James, they uh, arranged for Adrien and the three children who were in hiding uh, to flee France. And they saved the lives of, of Lafayette's wife and three children. It's really a spectacular story. Now, in, actually, in your Lafayette book, um, you mentioned how Adrien was, um, she was like the financial guru of the family. Yeah, she, yeah. Was, she was really, really strong with finances. Yeah. And that's a little bit, um, a little bit odd for, for, for that age. Well, uh, so was El El Elizabeth Monroe. She yes. was, uh, she and, and her husband, they were inseparable. It's, it's with, uh, their, their marriage is one of the great love stories uh, yeah. uh, in American history and certainly one of the great marriages in the White House. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, after they had gotten uh, Adrienne uh, out of France, uh, the revolutionary looters had looted hundreds of chateaus and, and, and mansions and all this uh, beautiful f uh, French furniture period, Louis XIV, 15th, and 16th, mm -hmm. uh, were for sale in these used furniture shops. And she went around snapping up furniture and furnishings, beautiful, exquisite pieces, treasures. And as first lady, she refurbished the White House because it, the interior had been gutted by fire in the War yeah. of 1812. And she refurnished it with all these beautiful furnishings that you can still see today in the public rooms uh, of the White House. Uh, beautiful French furnishings. And it's all because of Elizabeth Monroe. She was a great lady. Uh, Do you think she could foresee that this furniture she bought would be Yes. Still, she did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was a brilliant lady. She, she was way ahead of her time. She was well-educated uh, in art, in literature, in music. She was, uh, she was a spectacular first lady that uh, uh, it, it was really fun for me uh, to get to know her in writing this book. And I know readers will, will just fall in love with her. She was just great. It seems like reading um, both the Lafayette book and the Monroe book, there was a, a it seems like a lot of parallels between um, the relationships 
between um, uh, Lafayette and his wife and uh, Monroe and his wife. Both yeah. very strong women, smart, kind of almost uh, ahead of the curve for, for, for that time. And you've forgotten a, a couple of other founding fathers, similar relationships, George and Martha Washington, yep. John and Abigail Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jefferson's wife died when he was long before he was president. Uh, but Madison, uh, who married late, and his wife, mm -hmm. uh, Dolly, were very close. Uh, uh, with the exception of, of Jefferson, uh, really special circumstance because he lost his wife. Lost his wife uh, yes. uh, uh, but all the, these men were deeply in love with their wives and had very successful, warm uh, marriages, and they were real helpmates. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't uh, the uh, the, the wife that many people picture from that era, where it's yeah. just a decoration in the house. Yeah, they brought a, brought a lot to the table. Uh, absolutely. So. Uh, it almost seems as if, um, you know, the French were kind of baffled and uh, slightly disappointed when Monroe was uh, recalled um, back to the United States. Absolutely. And that was, that was during uh, a time of uh, deteriorating relations. Uh, do you believe that that... that helped facilitate even worse relations between the country? Or do you think if Monroe stayed, he could have um, you know, altered the, uh, the course of history a little bit between the two countries? Probably not, because we were treading uh, very difficult waters between Britain and France, the, the two most powerful nations on Earth. We couldn't afford to alienate either one, mm -hmm. uh, yet it was impossible to be allied to one without alienating the other. Yeah. So the Washington administration first and the Adams administration uh, were constantly treading water to, to try to uh, have peaceful, neutral relations uh, in this conflict between uh, uh, Britain and France, which is why Washington uh, signed the Neutra Neutrality Proclamation in 1793. Uh, but neither France nor England would, there was no such thing as neutrality. Washington invented the concept yeah. of neutrality in foreign affairs. And there, uh, there were many, many international rules on uh, war, mm -hmm. uh, what's legitimate and illegitimate in the conduct of war, but nothing about the rights of neutral nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Washington just invented this, this, this new uh, sphere. Yeah. It almost seemed like the United States was the rope in a tug of war between France oh, and England. Oh, it was. Uh, this, this, uh, they, they had visions, they both had visions which were inaccurate, of uh, somewhere in what is now the United States, there being as much uh, mineral wealth as they had found in Mexico. The Spaniards, after all, found the silver mm -hmm. mines of Mexico and were shipping silver back to Spain uh, by the boatload. And uh, everyone assumed, well, there was some, must be similar mines uh, in what's now uh, Canada and the United States. And of course there wasn't, but that was a great lure. Mm -hmm. uh, and both England and France wanted, well, they had titled France first. This was mostly all new France. Mm -hmm. And then after the uh, Seven Years' War, uh, the English uh, had most of North America and began the settlements uh, of it. When, um, when Monroe was governor, it, it seemed as if almost he, um, he was almost one of the first ones to use the bully pulpit, if I may say so. You know, I mean, kind of Teddy Roosevelt made it famous, but um, he didn't have the voting rights, but he, he, he used his, um, his right to speak um, to facilitate the changes that he wanted to as, uh, as Virginia governor. Exactly. Uh, so. uh, what people today uh, don't realize is how, power, how powerful the governor of Virginia was at, at the time. Virginia, the governor of Virginia uh, was the second most powerful political figure in America. Virginia was America's largest state. Mm -hmm. Its borders stretched to the Mississippi River and up to the Great Lakes. It was enormous. Mm -hmm. It had the largest population of any state in America, and it was the wealthiest state because tobacco was the major uh, crop that produced the most profits, uh, gross revenues and profits. Mm -hmm. So Virginia was the richest, largest, and most pop populous state. And the governor of Virginia then was the equivalent of uh, the governors of California, Texas, Illinois, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts put together. Mm. When he spoke, people listened. And that's what, and that's why Virginia's status is why 
four, four of the first five presidents came from Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. It was not a dynasty, as people like to call as some historians call it. It was simply, this was the, the biggest, most important state. It's the same reason later on New York produced a lot of presidents and, uh, and, and California produced a lot of leaders. Mm -hmm. It seemed like early, uh, early on, uh, Monroe was more of a Francophile. Um, but then he kind of changed his tune a little bit. I uh, wasn't a big uh, supporter of Napoleon. Um, what do you believe facilitated that? Was it the, well, was it the outcome of the French Revolution yeah. mostly, or it, 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 personal distaste well, it's for good, Napoleon? Good question, but because everyone was pro-French at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from Washington on down, because after all, Lafayette, with the help of Jefferson, uh, wrote the preamble to the French con new French Constitution. Mm -hmm. So the revolution was actually started by moderates, and they were intending to create a constitutional monarchy that would uh, be almost I identical to the, Ameri the new American government. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, all things started well, and then these uh, revolutionaries began to undermine the moderates and take over. The, they, they seized control of the revolution mm -hmm. and started slaughtering uh, people uh, for, for no reason. Very, very few of the, of the uh, thousands who died on the guillotine were actually, were, were ever tried uh, before jury of their peers, number one, but number two. Very few of them were the aristocrats and the priests who were allegedly the enemies of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Only 2% of the people who died on the guillotine were aristocrats, mm -hmm. and less than 1% were priests. Most of them fled. Most of the people who died on the guillotine, was, uh, the, the revolutionaries did exactly what the communists did. They denounced their neighbors because uh, you, you, you stepped on my lawn, or uh, uh, the baker, he uh, got a lousy piece of bread. Uh, he's an enemy of the revolution. Mm. Up, off with his head. Wow. So it was. Well, they believe the bread makers were hoarding. Bread yeah, it, it was a mass slaughter. And uh, remember, people like Monroe and Washington. Uh, these were uh, a very religious figures. They believed in justice, and and they believed in God. They believed in in mor moral behavior, and, and uh, uh, they couldn't stomach this, so they turned against it. And then, of course, when Napoleon came into power, uh, he was a dictator. Uh, yes. And and these were champions of uh, republicanism. Um, now, was there initial support for Napoleon because he did bring the law and order, or did they see uh, the makings of a dictator or another king? Right no, no, from, he was uh, a hero. He start. was a military hero. Mm -hmm. The French were conquering the world. Yep. Uh, so he was a, he was a great hero. They 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 loved him at first, and initially, uh, he did not start out to be a dictator. He started out really to, uh, well, he was going to be a benevolent dictator. He yes. did not. Uh, try to be if there is such thing. It's not <laughs> yeah. always the way. And uh, his plan was actually f uh, really f uh, forward looking. He w wanted to set up what he called the continental system, which would create a common market, an economic, common economic market in Europe. Uh, different from the one we know, however, it was a, uh, uh, everyone, everyone was equal except France was more equal than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, each of these other countries would feed their raw materials into France where French manufacturers would convert them into finished products which they would then resell mm -hmm. to all the other countries. And it never came to pass, of course, but that was his vision. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, uh, Napoleon's very instrumental in the formation of the United States with the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, well, he, he was caught by circumstances in that, and Monroe took advantage of it. Uh, you know, people give uh, Jefferson credit uh, for, the, for the Louisiana Purchase, and in fact, he had nothing to do with it. It was, well, he had something to do with it. He was president, and he did send Monroe over to purchase. Originally, the, the, uh, Monroe's assignment was to take $9 million from Congress and buy the island, just the island of New Orleans, which uh, farmers in the West, uh, for farmers in the West to float their uh, grain and furs and pelts down to that island for transshipment to European ports. Uh, when Monroe got over there, uh, Napoleon had now suffered a huge setback in Haiti, which was a French colony then. There had been a, a slave re re rebellion, 
and they had killed something like 10,000 French troops, including the commander-in-chief, who was Napoleon's brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, now he gets word from America uh, that, Ma that uh, Secretary of State Madison under Jefferson was prepared to mass uh, two or 300,000 American militiamen around New Orleans if the French tried to land there. So uh, things are looking bleak. Meanwhile, the Spaniards are rebelling mm -hmm. under Napoleon's yeah. rule. Yes. And so he uh, set a plague on all their houses. Uh, I'm going to take care of things at home. And he, he was now going to focus on Spain and let uh, Haiti and, and uh, Louisiana go down. And uh, Monroe comes at just the right time. Mm -hmm. And Monroe goes to an English bank on his own signature, borrows seven or eight million dollars more to lump with the nine million he had from Congress, and makes a deal to buy a million square miles, Louisiana Purchase, a million square miles, the largest acquisition of foreign territory, uh, peaceful acquisition of foreign territory in the history of the world. Never before has that much territory been acquired peacefully. And Jefferson, opposed it when he learned about it because he said it's unconstitutional. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the government the right to buy foreign territory. Mm -hmm. And as a strict constitutionalist, the government, he, he believed the government could not do, could not go beyond what was prescribed in the Constitution. Uh, so he actually was ready to scuttle a deal. Finally, Monroe talked him uh, into allowing it to go through. And uh, he realized, Jefferson realized that the popular opinion was all in favor. I mean, they hailed Monroe as a great hero for his acquisition of Louisiana. And Jefferson pennies on the dollar, there. too. Yeah. I Pardon? Mean, he, he got it for pennies on the dollar, basically. Uh, 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 was... uh, uh, two cents an acre at a time when wilderness land, were going, wilderness land was going for two dollars an acre. So this was, this was considered one of the greatest triumphs. And public opinion was so in favor that Jefferson had to back off and, and embrace Louisiana Purchase and Monroe. Uh, Just a question from someone naive about it all. Um, what would have happened if they hadn't bought it, if Napoleon didn't really have interest? Wouldn't it just become available if they didn't uh, buy no, it? We would have, no, it belonged to Spain. Now, Spain retroceded it uh, to France. So now France owned it. And originally, uh, uh, Napoleon had uh, 20,000 troops on board ships ah. in a Dutch harbor to sail over to New Orleans and take physical possession uh, of New Orleans and the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, the ships never sailed because they froze in the harbor in, in, in Holland. They lay there all winter long. There was nothing you could do to get them out. Uh, meanwhile, the, our administration got wind of it, and Madison, who was Secretary of State, uh, said, uh, prepared to send, uh, uh, I think it was 200,000 American militiamen to the Mississippi, uh, ready to greet Napoleon if he came over with his 20,000 troops. Uh, so he faced war now if he came over, and he pulled back, decided against it. And Jefferson should have realized how logical it was because it's in our, you know, it's almost like having two countries here. Exactly. But uh, Jefferson did have a point. The, the Constitution does not give the government the right. And, and uh, uh, he didn't want to violate the Constitution. Since then, presidents have gotten uh, more and more relaxed about violating the Constitution, as, as uh, former Vice President Cheney said of the Constitution. It's a quaint document. And the president ignores it, Congress ignores it, the Supreme Court ignores it. They do whatever they want now. I think one of the great ironies, though, is a, uh, Monroe never had a, a lot of personal capital. His finances seem to be, you know, not the greatest of all, but he seems to be the mastermind of one of the greatest business deals this country has ever seen. Yeah. You know, it's, kind of, it's just one of those uh, small history's ironies. Uh, another irony of history is that um, 
Aaron Burr actually stepped in between him and uh, Alexander Hamilton when they were about to duel. Yeah, and then seven, seven years later, they wind up dueling e each other. I found that uh, to be another one of, uh, one of history's uh, interesting yeah. ironies that, um, you know, he, would, he was, you well, know. Monroe was an anti-federalist and Hamilton was a federalist and they were insulting each other right and left. Yep. And Aaron Burr, who was uh, a congressman at the time, uh, and, and not yet the uh, ambitious person he became, uh, was the peacemaker and stepped in to prevent the duel between the two. And, and that too is an exciting story in uh, my book, The Last Founding Father. It seems that um, over the years, Monroe became less partisan with his politics, almost culminating with the era of good feeling. Do you think some of these experiences... Well, he, he was like Washington in that sense. Washington did not like politics. He, he felt that political parties divide the nation, and he wanted to unify the nation, and Monroe felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And both men did unify the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and Monroe's second administration, uh, second election, uh, there were no more, the political parties dissolved. Yeah. Everybody rallied around him. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he was our president, and we had no political parties. We had one party, and that was America. That yeah. was our nation. And as I say, not till the Second World War did Americans unite and pull together mm -hmm. uh, in that spirit. And unlike the Second World War, uh, Americans under Monroe pulled together to build this nation, to build a great, uh, prosperous nation, the, yeah. most, the, the greatest prosperity any nation on earth had ever, uh, and it was spread out across the entire spectrum uh, of, of, of the population. It wasn't just a handful of rich people uh, who were benefiting from this. It was a remarkable, uh, truly a, a social and political revolution that James Monroe was re responsible for uh, promulgating. One thing I, f I also find fascinating is he was able to perform the duties of Secretary of State and Secretary of War yeah. during the War of 1812. Uh, under, under James Madison. Well, James Madison did to England what the Japanese did to us at Pearl Harbor. We were negotiating peace with, with the British mm -hmm. uh, to secure our northern frontiers, and uh, they signed a, a treaty. Mm -hmm. And before it, it reached this country, uh, it, Madison's cabinet lost patience and talked Madison into invading Canada. So we declared war against Britain mm -hmm. they, uh, after having signed a peace treaty with them. Yeah. Uh, and now, he, Madison had had a falling out with uh, Monroe, and now uh, he realizes that his Secretary of State and Secretary of War has, has led him and the country astray. And uh, he turned, de out of desperation, he turned to Monroe, uh, who had been this great diplomat, uh, to be his Secretary of State. And Monroe agreed. And then uh, he was already Secretary of State. The Madison's Secretary of War left the, uh, the Washington area, the, the capital, defenseless. Uh, the, saying the British would never hurt our capital, they're, they're attacking on the northern frontier. Well, he, he was wrong. He ignored all sorts of uh, intelligence uh, that indicated the contrary. Mon Monroe was privy to all this intelligence, and Madison fired his Secretary of War and made uh, Monroe uh, acting Secretary of War. It was the first time, and the only time in American history that, same, that a man has held two cabinet posts at the same time. And he tried, the, by now the British had landed, he tried to forestall uh, the invasion, actually galloped to the front to uh, g do his own intelligence on the progress of the British troops, uh, was unable to prevent the sacking of Washington. And, uh, but then he, he organized the militia and sent them all into uh, Fort McHenry and the Baltimore area, which was the next target of the British troops, and uh, as you and all our viewers know, uh, uh, the battle raged through the night, and by dawn's early light, our flag was still there. Right. And the British retreated, left uh, thanks largely to the courage and brilliance of James Monroe, uh, who 
was our last founding father. He was really the last, and he saved the nation uh, in the War of 1812. You have like more than just a story of Monroe here. There's stories within stories within stories. Yeah. Well, so someone could actually do a film on just part of the book. I think so. Uh, I, I tried to uh, uh, tell the story of the times, what it was to live uh, in that era, and to tell the story of Monroe as uh, more than a president, uh, as a great hu human being, as a great American, the great American hero, also as a father, uh, as a husband, a loving father, and a, and a loving husband, um, and how he and, and Elizabeth lived in, in their homes. And uh, there are uh, photographs of uh, illustrations of the furnishings they had, which are, uh, are still, you can still view them in the White House, and at James Monroe's uh, home, uh, one of his homes in uh, uh, just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, right, actually right next to Monticello. It's, it's called uh, Ashlawn Highland, and it's uh, on the next hill uh, from Monticello. In this era of The Matrix, which I love, and Star Wars movies and big blockbusters, can a great story about this man reach the general public do you think that there's oh, enough here? Absolutely, and uh, that would be great if someone uh, made a, a film of this story. It's it's an it's an un it, it, it's a story that's not told enough. Monroe has been ignored, and that's why I I wrote the Last Founding Fathers to try to restore him to his proper place in history. Uh, as I told you before, the the, the famous painting uh, of Washington Washington crossing the Delaware. The soldier, the officer, standing next to him with the American flag is James Monroe. And, and that, that was painted 75 years later. So it, the, the two standing figures, the two important figures in the boat, uh, there was symbolic reason for putting Monroe there. Uh, one, the artist wanted to show Monroe as the hero of the Battle of Trenton uh, next to Washington. And two, to show uh, Monroe standing as the second most important president in the early years of our republic. It's fascinating stuff. One thing I, I, I don't think it's touched on enough is uh, the Monroe Doctrine. It almost uh, gets kind of set aside these days. It's not really a, a focal point of um, you know, curriculums or when I was going through college, it wasn't a focal point of any of the American history classes or anything like that. And it was a, it was a a very, um, a very important document, even even to this day. Yeah, it 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 uh, uh, it, it, it was not a, a standalone document. It was part of uh, Monroe's annual speech to Congress, and really, uh, the term doctrine is a wrong term. It's really a manifesto, and it's the second most important manifesto in American history after the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Monroe, uh, having rebuilt our defenses and made the nation impregnable to foreign attack, uh, uh, let the American people uh, migrate westward. They now felt secure for the first time in their history. And he now turned to the rest of the world and uh, said, we have a fortress over here. You're not going to break this fortress. The Americas are off limits for any more colonization. Uh, you stay out of our business. We'll stay out of your business. We don't want anything to do. You, you want to fight wars? Go ahead. Kill yourselves. But, and we won't butt into your affairs. Don't butt into ours. He, in effect, uh, in diplomatic language, uh, issued the warning on the Virginia flag that he carried into battle in the Revolutionary War with the coiled rattlesnake, don't tread on me. And that's what he told the rest of the world, telling them that uh, we don't want anything to do with them. They must not butt into our affairs. They will find it far more profitable to trade with us than to try to conquer us. And that became the basis of our foreign policy until the Second World War, at which point Franklin Roosevelt had no choice. After all, the Japanese and Germans attacked us. We didn't attack them. We had no option but to fight back. And since the Second World War, our deep involvement in Europe afterwards through the Marshall Plan and then the outbreak of the Cold War, which now takes our forces all, uh, every 
across the face of the earth to fight the communist threat, uh, that really was the end of the Monroe Doctrine. So it, it no longer exists as a, uh, a cornerstone of our foreign policy. Well, that's where Donald Pleasance got it in the James Bond movie. We are now impregnable. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to have a historian like Jay talking to you and someone like me that comes from a whole other sphere because I'm totally fascinated. You know, my interest is music and other history of music, if you will. But hearing this, it, it is an important story. Well, and I hope our viewers... When Monroe lived in Paris, uh, he bought his daughter uh, uh, an instrument which you can see at Ashland called a knee harp. Okay. And it was a, a harp, and it was quite popular in those days that sat, you put it on your thigh, and you'd play the, the, the harp. It was a very popular instrument, so she learned the knee harp. And they were a very musical family. Ah. Oh, Elizabeth played the pianoforte as it was called, then uh, the modern piano hadn't been invented yet. Uh, and uh, it was the, the era of Mozart. Mozart had just died. Uh, his music was popular all over the place. I hope our viewers you know, understand the importance of this. This is really good work you've done, and your work is, is vast because you have a number of books. When was your first book put out? Uh, I think it was around 1990. It's, uh, I've written so many since I lose track. Uh, I have uh, four books coming out in the next two years, the next one being uh, Lion of Liberty, who's coming out in a month, uh, uh, the uh, story of Patrick Henry. On De Capo. Uh, on De Capo Press, which is part of the Perseus Books Group. And then uh, a, a book next spring, which uh, will interest a lot of uh, your viewers, I think. Uh, it's uh, uh, called American Tempest, and it's the story of the original Tea Parties and how they generated uh, oh. the, the birth of our nation and the, uh, the, the liberties we cherish today. Nice. How did you, how did you get into reading, uh, writing history? Um, through a, a deep interest, I... I uh, uh, actually was writing books on education and uh, one of uh, the works I did was the, the, a three-volume encyclopedia of American education and in one of the biographies in there, the biography of Noah Webster who was really the father of our educational system, in writing about him uh, most people think of him as he just wrote a dictionary but he was the father of our, of our school systems mm -hmm. and basic methods of learning that we use and uh, his involvement, he was one of the behind the scenes uh, authors of the Constitution. And his involvement in the Constitution got me interested in all, all of his friends at <laughs> the Constitutional Convention. And off I went. <laughs> so he was behind the Constitution. Yeah. Again, fascinating stuff for those of us, especially, that's really a good thing that the Tea Party is just so prevalent now in American politics. People need to go back and and uh, if there was a father of, of, of uh, although he wasn't, he had nothing to do with the Boston Tea Party or the, you know, there were tea parties up and down the coast. It, was, it wasn't just one tea party. They were protesting the tea tax, not because it cost any money uh, or cost them much out of pocket. It was infant, uh, less than a penny per cup of tea. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the principle of taxation without representation. Taxation by a central government without the consent of the legislatures of the various colonies who were closer to the people. Yes. And Patrick Henry warned at the, cons at the ratification uh, convention, the ratification of the Constitution, that uh, passing the Constitution as written would give Congress a new, another central government the right to tax the people without the consent of the state legislatures. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, exactly what has happened. Congress can tax us uh, as much as it wants to, and uh, no state legislature can say, no, we won't pay the tax. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Henry warned of, of, of this. One thing I find fascinating and, is... And by the way, Monroe also warned. M Monroe was an outspoken opponent of the Constitution and voted against ratification of the Constitution mm -hmm. for that very reason. No. Well, it was very um, almost foreshadowing in, in, in certain ways that they, um, yeah. they could see kind of down the pipeline a little well, bit. Well, these were, these were the anti-federalists, as they were called. They, yes. they were against the Constitution as written, that it gave President, Congress, and Supreme Court far too much power. 
and, st and stripped the states of their sovereignty. At the time, the states were sovereign. Mm -hmm. yes. And the Constitution, uh, little by little, eroded their sovereignty mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, as both Henry and Monroe warned, uh, the necessary and proper phrase or clause in the Constitution gives Congress the right to pass any law it deems necessary and proper to the fulfillment of its constitutional duties. Yeah. So it, it, that basically an open door to pass any kind of law it wants to. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, you've got to have a, a two-thirds majority to override a, a, a presidential veto. So there's a, there are checks and balances on that. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a very uh, powerful tool that uh, Monroe and Henry uh, warned against. Similarly, the president's uh, role as commander-in-chief, uh, although the Constitution says Congress shall declare war, mm. Congress has only declared war five times in our history. Every yes. other war, the president has just taken the troops to war without any, any permission no. from anybody. Uh, and and he, the presidents over the years, starting with Washington, by the way, he was, not, he was as guilty as anybody else. Uh, and uh, this was happening so frequently, Congress uh, decided to give it some cash of legitimacy by passing the War Powers Act, which allows the president to do what he's been doing anyway, uh, but uh, uh, Congress has to approve it after, before 90 days. Yes. One thing I find fascinating about the book, and uh, I want to stress to the, um, to the viewers, is how it's, it's written and it reads almost like a novel. You know, I've read a, a lot of history over the years, and it's um, some of it's very dry, uh, regurgitating facts. These these books, the, the, the Lafayette book, the, the Monroe uh, book, uh, they read like a novel. Very simple to read, almost page turners. They are page turners, um, and I think that's 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 good because I think yeah, you can uh, reach a, a wider range of readers um, when they pick up the book and it's you fascinate almost from 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 the beginning of the. Um, of the book, so I, uh, I believe it's, it's well written in that aspect where it can reach more people um, just, by, um, you know, just by making it fascinating. And like uh, uh, Joe was mentioning earlier, the intertwining of uh, all the Founding Fathers, it's, 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 it's quite a piece. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is an exciting period of history. It's one of the most exciting periods of history, and it's a period of history that every American should know and, and feel proud of. Uh, I, I think we should be ashamed of ourselves for the Civil War. Yes. And yet the Civil War is glorified as some great thing. It's a, it's a Very dark days. It's a stain on, our, uh, on the honor of both Northerners and Southerners. Yes. That uh, here we are brothers fighting each other. That's, that's disgraceful. The Revolutionary War, we should be proud of. We, we created liberty. We created a nation based on justice and morality, and we should be very proud of that. It was an exciting period, and uh, more Americans should should know about that period. Yeah, I actually believe that the, um, that was the greatest generation. Absolutely, a lot's made of of the World War II generation, the generation that went through the Depression and World War II. But I believe the founding generation was the greatest generation. They really were, and they were an amazing generation. Uh, they were foresighted. They saw. Uh, a future uh, for their own people that uh, they believe that their own people are actually capable of governing themselves. Yeah. Uh, no one in the world thought that way. Yeah, uh, I, I think it was a combination of uh, foresight and hardships that really make them the, the, the greatest generation and the odds that they were facing. I mean, they were, they were facing some pretty steep odds oh, absolutely. against the British, the French, the Spanish. I mean, those were powerhouses and they had been for years. And the core of the Founding Fathers, uh, Monroe, Washington, uh, the core actually believed, and, and there was no chance of getting anything th uh, through uh, the government at that time, but they actually believed in emancipation. They were against slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, they believed in uh, uh, equal rights for women. Uh, Monroe, Adams, Washington, they, they not only loved their wives, they depended on their wives. Their wives were real partners mm -hmm. in, they, in, in their marriages. Yes. Uh, and so th their thinking in their homes was far ahead 
of the average home in that day, uh, that day and age. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there was no no chance of getting uh, having any political action on that. Yeah. Well, I think they recognized that it had to be done gradually over generations, yeah. and everything couldn't be done all at once. Um, which was another that was um, you know was another uh, good foresight on their part that they recognized that um, they can only take it so far right. in, in, in certain ways before it would maybe come apart if they try to take it too far. But I mean, with with Monroe, uh, I mean to turn over the. Uh, in uh, refurbishment and decoration, everything of of the nation's the man, the presidential mansion, turns it over to his wife to do. He <laughs> very little do, and she's dictating the architect what she wants done. She wants this kind. Sends list of uh, uh, she needs this kind of money from Congress. Uh, she needs ten thousand dollars for this, and uh, that was her. She did all this. Same thing with Martha Washington. She. Uh, uh, she ran the household. She ran the, the, the family budgets. She, uh, uh, I, I did a biography on Washington called uh, the, the Unexpected George Washington, his private life. And uh, Mar Martha handles the family budgets. <laughs> Does, uh, she, she was a remarkable woman, and I'm sure everybody knows about Abigail Adams, <laughs> yes. one of the most yeah. outspoken uh, ladies in American history. Mm -hmm. You have this coming out in paperback on October 1st, and the Patrick Henry book is out in September. Yeah. So you'll be talking about Patrick Henry, but then this book is available too in hardcover and softcover. Absolutely. Is there a thread between the two books I intentionally? Well, uh, obviously they, both Monroe, uh, Monroe and Henry uh, knew each other and were close political allies in the uh, battle against ratification of the Constitution. Uh, Pat, uh, James Monroe was in Congress and would, uh, would wrote constantly to Patrick Henry to let him know of the progress uh, in Congress uh, in, in terms of the, uh, get the uh, uh, appointment of a, of a constitutional convention and, and at the ratification convention in Virginia, they uh, fought together against ratification um, and almost won, almost won. So perhaps my question should have been, are you thinking ahead to the next book while you're doing one? No, I'm, oh. I, I focus on the one book and then when that book's finished, uh, there may be enough, uh, enough interest builds up in another character. Ah. That so that's your inspiration because you have like four more books coming yeah, out, right? Exactly. So how do you keep track of all this information? Well, it's all from the same period, and uh, in the case of Henry and Monroe, they're both fighting for the same principles. Um, and interestingly enough, Monroe, of course, after he becomes president, necessarily becomes a federalist. Patrick Henry dies prematurely. Uh, and never having had a chance to uh, uh, run for higher office, but he, he really wasn't interested in higher office. He really was interested in freedom at the local level. Hmm. Uh, leave me alone. I like I've, that. I, I've got my farm. Leave me alone. Uh, and most farmers, remember 95% of Americans then were farmers. And the farmer then, and uh, great extent today, the real farmer, uh, he works hard to, to turn the ground over, plow the ground, plant, uh, take care of his crops, and with God's help and his own hard work, what comes out of the ground, he f feels is his, and he doesn't want some tax man coming across his property and say, I want part of that. Uh, to him, to the farmer, that's just confiscation of his property. And Henry had a, had a farmer all his life. He loved farming, as did Washington, as did Monroe. And uh, they felt strongly about these things. Um, the, the, the farmer lived an independent life, on, fed his family. If he had a surplus, he could make a little extra money. Uh, he let his neighbors alone, didn't expect his neighbors to bother him. Uh, the neighbors would come together, 
uh, on Sundays at church, and they'd come together if uh, they were attacked by uh, a band of Indians. But normally, a farmer would defend his, tar his own property with his, with his rifle. Uh, there were always oh, squatters and renegades, mm -hmm. and, and he'd defend himself. If it was a large group of Indians, and the farmers would get together and form their militia and elect their own leader as a militia commander. Or they'd get together if uh, a, a lightning struck a barn and the barn burned down, well, they'd get together to help their neighbors rebuild the barn as quickly as possible so they could go on with their farming. But it was basically, leave me alone. You know, I'm not bothering anybody. <laughs> I'm staying here on my property. Leave me alone. One thing I, I, I do think is also fascinating about the time period is um, the hardships on, on public servants. Uh, it seems today that public servants are, you know, well paid. They travel a lot, um, but back then it was uh, it was a very low paying job. Sometimes you wouldn't get paid. You get a promise of land or something. And um, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of these people um, died without much money to their name too. And it, it seemed like it was more uh, a more um, a more noble and a more honest um, profession back then. Public service was an obligation of of landowners. We own the land. Uh, we've got to pass the laws and we've got, we've got to govern the land. Yes. Uh, and uh, it was their uh, sacred obligation. It was the, the words are in the, in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, they pledged uh, their, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And that was not just to fight for independence in the war, which is why Monroe served with no pay in the war, Washington with no pay. It was also in, in public service. It was your obligation to serve uh, in your state legislature and uh, later on in Congress. Uh, congressmen earned $9 a day. And remember, they all had jobs. They were they, largely farmers, planters, uh, and some, some lawyers. Uh, so they only were in, in action as lawmakers. Uh, in the case of Congress, uh, six weeks, six to 12 weeks a year. State legislatures, maybe six weeks a year. They really didn't need, they didn't just uh, go to, uh, they, they went to pass laws that were actually needed. When they'd go home, they were members of the general population. So they knew what was needed at home. They need, knew if there was, there was a need for a road to connect uh, the, the, uh, the Western Territories with the East through the Cumberland Gap. So they'd go to Congress and they'd pass a law creating that thing. And that's it. They didn't pass laws frivolously. And they tried to get pass what was needed, basically essential to the survival of the country, and then get home and go, go about uh, their lives. Uh, but this was their sacred obligation, their, their duties. Today, we have an entire class of full-time uh, politicians who have no other jobs. Yes. And as a result, they feel they have to keep passing laws. Yes. Even when they're, they're not, uh, or, or at least debate laws, even when there's no need for them. And the, the, aside from uh, the, this uh, invented necessity to keep passing law after law after law, uh, they're out of touch with, with the ordinary people because they don't have real jobs. No. They wow. don't suffer the same They don't hardships. go home and farm and find out the needs of a farmer. They don't go home and build houses or uh, uh, work in a factory. So they don't know what the needs are. And this opens the door for these uh, lobbyists to come in and tell them what the needs are. Mm -hmm. Well, you haven't, you haven't been home for a while, but I just got, came from your, your uh, district, and uh, the people want such and such. And the poor congressman hadn't been, uh, he has no way of knowing. And he says, oh, is that what they want? Yeah. And, and, uh, and we've got a little money here that's going to back your next campaign. Wow. Uh, HarlowGilesUnger.com is the website. HarlowGilesUnger.com. Jason Harris, Harlow Giles Unger. 55 minutes just fly by, don't they? They do indeed. They certainly do. I've learned so much 
and, and this is fascinating stuff. Thank That's you so much for being on Visual Radio. Thank you for inviting me. As uh, the Oracle and the Matrix says, our Thank time you. is Thank up. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for watching. Thanks to Lisa Warren at, at the Capitol Press and to Joe LaRocca, our director, Charlie Torella, and to Windcam, of course. Another man.